Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. Today's guest is Charles Carrillo. He's the managing partner of Harborside Partners, a real estate syndication firm. And he has been actively investing in multifamily and commercial real estate since 2006. At that time, I haven't even heard about that you can invest in real estate. So that's awesome. Since that time, he has invested in over $200 million worth of invest, uh, real estate investments. And Charles is also the host of the Global Investors Podcast, where he interviews professional about investing in U.S. real estate. And I, I remember I was one of the guests as well on the podcast where we talk about, you know, my investments in farmland, my investments in India, etc. So welcome, Charles. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Absolutely. And I am personally looking forward to this episode because we yeah. want to talk about how international investors can invest in the U.S. But before we get started, I asked this stupid question to all the guests. Tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. Uh, I would say something unique, uh, interesting about myself is I am a an Eagle Scout, which is something that oh, uh, nice. very, very few people... Uh, Someone brought it up on a podcast like a week or so ago, and I was like, yeah, it's something that I don't hear that much people bring up. So I would say it's one interesting thing about myself. Yeah, and I was I was in Scouts as well in India when I was growing up. I never got to the last level, but I'm hoping, and, and I don't know if you know, but they allow girls now. So mm -hmm. both of my daughters are in Scout, and I'm hoping at least one of them would get to the Eagle Scouts there. <laughs> Fantastic. That's awesome. That's great to hear. So I'm very involved right now. So I exactly know what's you know needed and what's what's it's all about, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so you started back in 2006. I want to know what was your first investment and how did it work out for you? So my first investment was uh, in 2006, as you said, and it was a, um, now we call it house hacking, but back then we didn't have really a name for it. And it was a triplex and I was living in one of the units and renting out the other two. And that's how I got my start in it. It was something my father had suggested it to me. My dad had been investing um, in multifamily since 1984. Oh, so, wow. So I grew up in, he self managed all his properties. He had like a, him and a partner and they had like a small team that managed their properties. And there were, there were D-class properties, some C-. minus. It's just, it wasn't great properties, but oh. it was a very interesting time. Um, you know, a great education I got from everything from dealing with contractors to uh, collecting rent with him apartment to apartment back in the days. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have these fancy uh, yes. apps on phone where you're going to pay rent. And um, so it was it was really a lot of door knocking, uh, writing receipts on carbon paper and uh, all that kind of stuff. So that's how I learned initially. And then I used my dad as a mentor on my first investment and in, uh, utilizing my FHA mortgage to be able to do a um, as a recent college grad to uh, be able to uh, purchase a triplex, live in one of them, and then rent out the other two. Um, initially, it was to it was only about a mile and a half from the college I graduated from in Connecticut. So it was initially to people that uh, friends from college that rented it. And then a couple of years later, at the end of 08, I bought another triplex about a, a block or two away. And um, and that was really when we started seeing, you know, the the great financial crisis was was already yeah. happening. It was a couple months after Lehman, and it was like a month or so before Bernie Madoff came out. So it was a very interesting <laughs> time of a lot of stuff uh, hitting the fan. Let's just say. So that that is very interesting. So basically, investing in real estate is in your genes, right? Pretty much. So. Uh, of course, we know right now, and uh, I don't want to go off a tangent, but that's very interesting. So I want to ask you, so were you employed uh, by your dad? Like, you know, now we remember for tax reasons, it's good to employ your kids and, you know, pay them a salary. It works out really well and, uh, well, and then they got to figure out how to work in the business as well. Uh, it was, I don't think I was, I wasn't, I wasn't paid really. I, I counted rent money. That was one thing I did. And I remember I would count out rent money and then I got a dollar for doing that. And, uh, plus sweeping, a lot of hallway sweeping, a lot of, uh, a lot of running up and downstairs to drop off receipts and pick up money. And my dad would stay downstairs 
in his car or whatever, or meet with one of his superintendents. And I would run up three slight flights up, three flights down, knocking on a door. Hey, this is Charlie's son, you know, and get the money <laughs> back down. I get a receipt. <laughs> I run it back up. So it was, uh, it was a very interesting thing. And it was like, you know, you, you had to talk to people and, uh, I don't know. It, it gets you out of your comfort zone very fast when Bless you, you when you get put into that type of situation. But you learn a lot. And then I really got into it in, um, I guess, uh, in high school. And um, I really liked it, you know, thought this would be a way, a, a path for myself of maybe not going full time into it like I am now, but as an investment for my life. And uh, so I spent a lot more time and we went to closings, we went to evictions together, we went to court together, we went everywhere, you know, everywhere my dad could take me. And so it was a great education, just uh, learning the ins and outs of how to deal with people in the multifamily, and especially with the less ideal properties. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. D-class properties, mm -hmm. C minus, the, the, those are the toughest ones, right? Yeah. So no. Oh, yeah. Don't buy those. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, I learned it myself. Yeah. In Everybody does. My, yeah. my first investment, I invested in D-class and lost every penny. So I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it, Everything, it looks beautiful on paper. I can show you yes. one right now. We'll pull one up online and yes. it will look like the best investment you'll ever make in your life. And then when you're there, you're like, oh my God, this is, yeah. this is a nightmare. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My returns were like 2%. And I'm like, oh that's awesome <laughs> if i can make two percent a month <laughs> yeah so let's talk about u.s real estate right because we have a lot of foreign investors you and i yep. right because uh, they reach out to us they want to invest why should one invest in u.s real estate as a foreign investor so u.s real estate is a i, I find it's a very I you know I hate to say recession recession resistant, but the asset classes that uh, you know you and I invest into, uh, for the most part, we're dealing with. Um, for you, I know mobile home parks as well, but we're really focusing on multifamily properties, and we're focusing really on B class multifamily properties, and these are really solid uh, properties, um, usually. 30, 40 years old or less, you know, 20 to 40 years old. Um, they're in areas that are growing. Uh, they have a very steady tenant base in these properties, whether that's people that are in good times moving out to go to A and people from C going into the B or people coming from where we are now, people probably tighten their belt a little bit. They're going A to B, you know what I mean? Um, and it's a it's a place where people are you know if you're gonna if you're gonna stay there long periods of time it's gonna be something in a B class property so these are like these are the big things about um, investing into U S real estate but I mean U S U S real estate is really a it's a huge I mean there's so many different stuff you can invest right. into but what we're what we're really talking about really is a multifamily and that's something that. Um, you know, you're, we're buying these properties, hundred plus units, um, and um, we have a hundred, you know, hundred different income streams are coming in on that property every month. Um, these leases are one year leases on the properties, maybe a little shorter sometimes, depending on um, how you're working with maybe a specific tenant. But most of the time, it's all twelve month lease, and this allows you to every year, if we're going through something that's inflationary times, we're able to uh, you know readjust those rents. Uh, and um, this way, we're not getting too much behind inflation when we're writing these leases. So with all this put together, and the other thing too is financing is very favorable here in the United States, which obviously pushes some of the asset prices higher. But um, properties actually cash flow and um, in the United States and multifamily, right? Or if they're purchased correctly, they they will cash flow. And that's very difficult uh, when I talk about other countries and other regions of the world where that's not really the case. Um, you know, there's um, many different regions of people I've spoken to or properties I've reviewed myself outside of the United States. And then when you do the numbers, um, you find out that uh, you're really just betting on appreciation in yes. a lot of these markets. Uh, and in most places, you're actually having negative cash flow. Yes. So you're maintaining this property. Uh, every month um, out of your pocket, hoping that 5, 10, 15 years down the road, it's going to appreciate and make some sort of return for you, which is a it's a dangerous investment decision. It's one thing if you just have a ton of money and you know that going into it and you're just putting a portion of your wealth there. It's a different thing if you're really trying to make money in it. Um, it can it can be it can be dangerous because who knows where we're going to be in five years, ten years. I mean, if you told us in two thousand, uh, you know, twenty seventeen, in three years we'd be in a pandemic. No one would know that. So it's something right. that um, you have no idea where we were now with the interest rates going so high. Everybody tells you that there's not really anybody that said interest rates were going to go that high that fast. So 
um, you know, knowing these things, they dramatically change uh, the trajectory of a property that's bought for appreciation versus with cash flow. Um, we know what our monthly expenses are. We have an idea of what our rent will be when we take out for, um, you know, for uh, for vacant units. And now we can say, okay, this is going to be this range is where we're probably going to be, be able to uh, make this cash flow every month. And that's something that's just not available in many countries. All right, I agree. And and then one last thing I want to add is that. US, the dollar is the reserve currency. It's yeah. one of the most stable currencies out there, right? So that's another thing. You do not have the currency or exchange risk as well. Right. So no, that, that was great. And um, I agree because I looked into Panama, Belize real estate, Costa Rica, and the numbers you know, did not make sense unless you want that property for yeah. yourself yeah. that you are going to enjoy. And then in, in turn, you know, you want someone to at least pay some of the mortgage, right? Right, But exactly. most of the time it's negative cash flow. So let's talk about the meat of the podcast and, and which most of the investors struggle with, including even, you know, myself, how to invest in U.S. real estate as a foreign investors, passively or actively? Okay, that's a great question. So this is like the basis of uh, the podcast that uh, I was so lucky to have you on as well to interview you. And so my podcast, Global Investors Podcast, is a podcast that's really focused around this topic. And I know you have a a, a number of international investors. So it's a large portion of your base. And really what happens is when an international investor um, contacts us, and, and my background for this is I ran a business uh, for many years, a payment processing business, and I would spend a couple months a year in uh, in Europe and for partners and for clients that were there and banking partners. It was it was it was a payment ba- uh, pace, uh, payment processing uh, banking related business. Yeah. So with that happening is that I would talk to people and they want to invest in the U.S. When you talk about all the great things about it that we just went through, and I didn't know how to do it. So that's how I started the podcast. And really, what happens is when someone reaches out to us and um, they're they're a foreign investor, we really want to see if they have any type of base or anything set up here in the United States. We find that uh, when we speak to, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but when we speak to people that are investing in the United States, they've done it before, maybe not on a grand scale, maybe they have an investment here or there, but it's they've never done into real estate. And that's a different because it's probably going to be a larger investment than they were doing before. Right. And then the other thing in regards to that is that it's going to be something that um, there is a number of different hurdles that have to be... Uh, that you have to look out for and you have to work with in order to do this correctly. And I think number one with this is that uh, when someone reaches out to us, we'll give them a list of attorneys and also accountants that work with foreign investors. And that's really important because it allows them, depending on what country you're coming from, to know the tax treaties between your countries, because it's going to be very different. It's, um, you know, just because you're investing here in the United States, you're not changing your residency or anything like this. You have residency in another country, and that's where you're paying taxes. And then you're going to be paying taxes here on your U.S. gains, but it's going to be a little differently how it's done. So really what normally happens is that um, the attorney or the accountant, uh, depending on and everybody's situation is different. I'll just give an overview of what normally happens. Uh, normally, you're working with one of these professionals. They're gonna they're going to review the tax trees, if any, between your com- uh, country of tax residency and the United States. And then what's going to happen is if you don't have any kind of ties in the sense of uh, you've never invested here before, uh, typically what will happen is they'll set you up with an you know, and you will apply for an ITIN number, I T I N number. And then once you get that, and don't do it by yourself. It takes the the professionals have a way of fast tracking it through. Okay. Don't do any of this stuff by yourself. But of course, it's just, <laughs> um, <laughs> fast tracking it way through. And then once that's set up, that's really kind of like your social security number, as we would call here in the United States. Yes. And that allows you then to go to the next step, which is what we would suggest. Now you could invest using just that ITIN number, but if this is going to be something that you're going to be doing. Uh, it's not a one-off. It's going to be something that, hey, you know, I do really want to add and diversify into U.S. real estate. Um, so well, what we'll do is you probably will set up some sort of corporation. Typically, that will be a limited liability corporation or LLC, which is also in a lot of other countries as well. So you might be familiar with it already. Right. And uh, you would be put as the owner of that. Now, your attorney will be able to direct you to which state because every state's going to be separate. Uh, has her own LLC setup situation. So uh, that's going to be 
Def definitely how you're going to do it. Like if you're coming from Canada because of tax treaties, it wouldn't be an LLC. It would be an LLP because the LLC wasn't around back in the 80s um, when they came up with the LLC. You know, LLC came after the LLP. Our tax treaty was signed before that. So these are things that your attorney would know because then you'd get hit with double taxation. So these are just interesting things that your attorney will be able to tell you and explain to you when you, uh, when you reach out to them. And then really when you're setting up that LLC, the, the next part of that is then going to be after that setup, you're going to open up a U.S. bank account. And typically, I would imagine you're going to use the mailing address for all this as your attorney or your accountant is going to be your legal address here in the United States of where they're going to send it if there's any mail there. But a lot of these accounts will require a U.S. address, um, if not all of them, um, what we've been speaking about. So they'll probably use the um, the attorney's office as that legal address. And when you open up the bank account, at that point, you're you're really done with the process. It's, that's everything set up. So now when you invest into uh, a syndication, uh, whether it's passively or if you're actively investing into real estate, you would use that limited liability corporation, that LLC in most instances, as uh, the entity that's going to own that. And then the last thing is just putting money into that. So you would just uh, transfer money from your home country, your other bank account, uh, into this corporation here in the United States. And then when you're making the investment, you will make the investment from that US-based bank account. So it really is to go over, it's really, in most situations, it's usually setting up the ITIN number, then it's usually setting up some sort of entity, which is typically an LLC, and you get a different kind of number, which is an EIN, employee identification number. So you have these two numbers, and then you're opening up a bank account, and you'll use both those numbers to open up the bank account. Once the bank account is open, you fund it, and now you're using that LLC and the bank account as the corporation, and that's where you're going to make all your investments. So all your money uh, goes from that bank account to your investments. And when money comes back from your investments, hopefully, it goes from the properties into your LLC bank account. And then at that point, you can then make the distributions, you know, wire transfers to your, to your own home, home, home country if you'd like to. Um, and then that's kind of how the whole thing works. And then, so that's really on the setup. The second part that uh, is obviously why we're always working with professionals on this is because of the tax portion. And the tax yes. portion is something that, Every investment is going to be a little different. And I'll talk about, um, we have a lot of great tax benefits here for real estate investors. Um, that probably is one thing that we left out in the beginning and uh, of why to invest in US real estate. Yes. But we have a lot of tax deferral and it's very important, it's deferral. So you can really, I want to say tax-free, there are deferral strategies that the United States has put up to make sure and to really promote people investing into real estate. And they're very advantageous. Um, so it's something where, you can defer, in other words, kick the can down the road of when you owe taxes, if ever, if done correctly, um, or at, probably will be a minimal amount, as most investors see. And that's something in that situation is where if you're investing passively, say, into one of our, um, your or my um, type you know, syndications, when we're getting money out of that, there's going to be one extra step that that syndication, the syndicator has to do, and that's going to be withholding a portion of your distributions. Now, this is not something that happens with U.S. citizens. Right. And the reason for that is because we already have most likely money on hold with the government from a W-2 or another job that we've been paying into, and they can come after us in the United States. They're not going to be going out of the country looking for someone that owes them taxes. That's why what happens is a percentage of it, uh, typically, I believe it's like 30, 30% is going to be held, and that's going to be paid in withholding for you as the international investor. And then when your accountant at the end of the year files the tax return that you get from, say, the syndication, that is when you're going to be able to re, uh, receive back um, a portion, probably all that money, because in the first couple of years, there's a lot of depreciation. So right. you'll probably be able to defer that. Now, if you've purchased your own properties and you're more active, so you're buying your own properties and you're renting them out or what you're doing with them, short-term rentals, um, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be similar where... Um, not, you know, where you're going to, um, it probably won't be withheld from you because if it's your own property, you're getting paid on it, but it's something where you're going to still need to have the accountant in any way to file your annual taxes. And it's very simple if you're in, in syndication, because, um, you know, Alpash or myself, we're going to send you a K1 at the end of the year, right? It'll usually be in March or April, uh, of the year for the year prior. And then all you do is you just forward that to your accountant. And your work is really done. 
at some point in the future, you're going to get money back into your bank account, usually automatically. And that's really how that how that works. Um, if you're doing an active real estate investment, it's going to be a little bit more on the tax preparation. And say, if you have a property management company, they'll be providing you with reports. And then you probably will work with your accountant. I imagine your accountant will assist you most likely on putting together the bookkeeping and the numbers. And they're going to charge you a little bit more for that because it's more active for them. It's not just like getting one K-1, right. we call it tax return and bringing it to them and then filing it. It's all, all the work's done on that part, really. You know what I mean? So this is just a couple things that you'll have to know when you're becoming more active and you're running more of an active uh, uh, investment business here in the United States, you're going to be paying for more preparation on the tax side when versus when it's a passive investment, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be paying up front to get everything set up as we've uh, spoken about already. But uh, going forward, it's going to be something that uh, it's, you know, you're just getting a couple returns, you send it to your accountant, they file them, and you're done with it, you pay them and you'll get your money back. That's awesome. Thank you so much for deciphering all of this. You know, this was great. So I think it totally makes sense. And and uh, and I just want to remind listeners, ITIN or SSN means a tax ID in US, right? And we even personally, Charles or I, even we rely on professionals, right? So especially if you are outside of US, you definitely want to rely on professionals. Make sure that they do it right. They, uh, they cross the I and, uh, you know, dot the T or, you know, cross the T yeah. and dot the I's, right? Uh, so that, that's very important. So let's talk about, you know, as a foreign investor, how do you perform due diligence, right? Most of the time, uh, you know, you and I and a lot of other people who they are here, of course, they read the media, news or whatnot, job growth. They can understand economic activity and even they can fly out there and visit the, you know, uh, property as well or the location, how um, how foreign investors can do that when they are not even able to, let's say, COVID happens, they can't even fly here, right? Yeah. So what kind of due diligence or how can they perform due diligence? So I have one of my, one of the attorneys that I will refer people to, he's based in Dallas and he works with a lot of our um, Chinese investors. And he is, he would tell me, he's like, I get paid sometimes just to drive by properties for clients. Right. Of course. And so he's he's like, I can't believe it. They're paying me like three fifty an hour or something to drive by properties. But he's like, who else? When I think about it, I'm like, well, who else are they going to trust? You know what I mean? So it depends on really what your strategy is. Number one, because if you're going, if you if you make the you you make the decision and you're like, I'm going to be an active investor, or if I'm going to be a passive investor. If you become an active investor, you now are starting a business here in the United States. You need to have a team. And there's many different people on the real estate team. You know, everything you'll need when you're buying properties um, from the real estate broker, insurance broker, mortgage broker, uh, property manager, um, you know, all the vendors that are assisting on the property, you know, plumbers, electricians, people putting on roofers, um, you know, handymen that come out there to do minor repairs on the property. Um, you know, all these different people you need to build relationships with. Now you can get those through other professionals. So if you have a very good real estate agent here on the ground, um, they might be able to refer those people to you, good vendors, good property management, but still you're going to have to know when it comes to it, what you're investing into. So what you feel comfortable with, and then you're going to have to do a lot of due diligence on, on everything with finding the property. As we we're talking about before, um, you know, we were throwing around D-class properties and stuff like that, and just not investing them, kind of laughing about them. But the thing that was that the funnel of like where you're targeting your properties. I mean, it's for someone that's coming outside of the United States, they have to pick the state, then they have yes. to pick, you know, the the metro, right? The MSA we call it, and then you're like going down into neighborhoods. And I mean, neighborhoods change dramatically. You know, I've had. I've had properties where my first property I bought was kind of difficult to keep tenants over a year there, right? Well, it was it was not the it wasn't the best property, right? It was just it had hard parking, all this kind of stuff like this. I bought a property a block and a half away, literally had tenants there for 12 years. So yeah. the thing that was that it just depends very specifically on the area. I mean, the, the specific, specific like to the lot the area where you are, and also depends on, um, you know, the type of tenant you're finding in there and the size of the property and the condition of that property. So these are things that if you feel you can do it and you feel you really want to take this on, become an active investor. 
And there's other ways of doing it. I know some active investors that are international that will buy like turnkey properties, so properties that have been like um, renovated and um, you know they look uh, a lot of stuff. I you know I guess has been fixed on it and stuff like this. And you know that's fine. But when someone's buying a property, let's say for fifty thousand, and they're putting twenty five thousand into it, and then they're selling it to you for a hundred, and you're going to rent it for twelve hundred a month, and you're going to make a couple hundred dollars a month, and that's great. The thing that was that when that person sold it to you, the value was already created, right? The rehab was already done on it. So you're coming in as we would call as a yield investor, right? You're just coming in there to get a, you know, several percent, let's say a single digit return every year on that property. And that's kind of where it ends. And you can do that. You can do that in a lot of other asset classes without having to buy property. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it's it's one thing is just know exactly what your goal is before you when you're figuring this out figure out what your exact goal is. I think most investors out there they really want the benefits of real estate and they don't really want to go through anything what I just described about of building course. a team, finding a market. I mean finding a market is very difficult. Um one of the groups that I work with, they literally have two people. This is a US based firm. They have two people, a uh, data scientists they call them. All they do is review markets throughout the United States. So when you have, when you're paying people right right there, that type of money to just review markets, they're not doing anything, right? They're just reviewing markets, picking out markets in areas where they see that there's going to be, you know, there's going to be consistent growth in the future. Um, if you think you can do that part-time from another country and you're not able to come here or you don't live here, that's fine. Do it. But it's, it's, a, it's not a... You know, it's not something where you're going to buy a property off uh, Facebook Marketplace or something, and it's going to turn into a great property for you. You know what I mean? It might, but the problem is that you really have to know what you're buying, and different parts of the country operate it very differently. You know what I mean? So um, there's, you know, where we're really focused on in the Southeast United States, it's had tremendous growth for 30, 40 plus years consistently. You know what I mean? There's been people moving down here. It's very pro business, and these are areas, but it's not the complete southeast, right? Um, right. It's um, you know Georgia is a lot different from Louisiana, and yeah. Alabama is a lot different from Mississippi, and they're very close to each other. But it's something that some have business, uh, some have a growing population, and some don't. So it's something that's very you have to you have to really know that you're going to spend the time to do your due diligence before you jump in, and that's one way that most of people that we work with are passive investors that really have offloaded that task onto us to uh, to invest alongside us in deals um, that we have vetted, that we have partners on the ground that we have worked with that are experienced in the type of property that we're going to be buying again with them. So just figure out exactly what your real goal is. And then I would think take the next step and know this when you're going to reach out to um, you know, to a professional, to an accountant, to an attorney, and let them know, hey, this is what I want to do, and um, you know, hopefully, um, if they're good, they'll be able to counsel you not just on the transactions, but also on if this is the right thing for you to do, and if this really fits into your overall plan. So it's it's always great to have educated people that you can rely on to make decisions. Hey, thank you so much, Charles. This was awesome. Let's move on to the next st stage of the podcast. Are you ready for fire round? I am. Would you be changing business or investment strategy because of the current environment where the inflation is still there and recession seems to be around the corner? Uh, so we have just... Uh... We've just really, we're always buyers of property. Um, we haven't bought in several months, but we always are looking and um, not looking as many deals now, but it's just something that um, we're being a little bit more conservative than we always have been. But um, for years, since 2020, we've, uh, as I was telling you before the show, we've really switched our investment strategy to B-class properties from C-class and um, something that I started investing in in 06. So we just pretty much are selling our last property right now at C-class. Let's really how we've been over the last three years changing our business plan to getting into better properties that have better tenants and what we call is credit tenants. So tenants that actually have credit scores that are buying cars, houses that want to keep that credit score, which means in other words, paying rent on time. That's great. Favorite nonfiction book, uh, self-help, business, investment? <laughs> I would say the 80-20 principle. I think it's Richard uh, Richard Koch. Uh, that is the one, K-O-C-H. So that's a fantastic book that uh, anybody can read. And it doesn't matter. You don't even have to be in business. You don't have to be in real estate. You don't have to do anything. Just if you read it, 
you can, it, it goes to every part of your life from, you know, uh, figuring out that the main principle is that 80% of what you do brings 20% of your results. And it's really finding out what that 20% is that brings to 80% of your results and really pouring the gas on that 20%. You can find out it's great for salespeople because you really figure out when you have sales and clients and you see exactly where you're really making your money when you break it down and where you should be spending time where you shouldn't be. So, but you can use it everywhere. There's a lot of examples in that I, book about workout. You know what I mean? So. No, I, I agree about the book. You can apply it to anywhere and it's, it's based on Pareto principle, right? Yeah. So that's awesome. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without? Um. So I, I, I look at a lot of different websites. Um, I love like Chatham Financial. That's a great website for going through rates. They have some insight on there that's very good, but the rates, um, it's very easy to, uh, you have an idea of kind of where the market's going with all the different uh, rate indexes that they track. So it's a great website for any person in finance at all to kind of see exactly where rates are and um, how it how it really the insights that really changes to um, your life and your business. So that'd be one thing that you add to your your list of bookmarked websites when you're checking them. Um, that would be one I would say. That's awesome. Any advice for investors? So for new investors, um, if you're going to be an active investor, I would say, you know, I like I would suggest how I started. If you want to go down that route, maybe if you're single and you don't mind living in a uh, multifamily property, use your FHA mortgage buy a property and uh, move into one of them, rent out the others. But either way, whatever you're doing, um, when you're buying a property as your first property, I would buy a property that was very, you know, I would buy something that has minimal, if any, renovation required. Buy something that doesn't really require much work. Um, buy something that has, you can get long-term fixed debt on and always, always have a reserve fund that's bigger than what you think. And if you do those three things, it's very difficult to lose money in real estate and also in a good area. Don't buy any D-class properties, please. No matter what the broker tells you, don't do it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> How do you give back? Uh, one thing that my wife and I have been doing for several years is we do a... Um, we do a monthly uh, donation to different charities. So it's one thing that we do every month and it's two specific charities that uh, near and dear to our heart or depending on the time of year too, you know what I mean? Or if there's some sort of um, natural disaster or something like this that happens that will skew it to what we're going to invest that month into. This is great. How can my listeners reach out to you? So, uh, well, that'd be great. Yeah. So our company is Harborside Partners. So harborsidepartners.com. And if you go on harborsidepartners.com, uh, you'll see everything. We have a YouTube channel. We have a podcast I do. Great interviews uh, like with Alpash I did. Um, I do that once a week. And then I also have a Strategy Saturday episode where we break down in five to 10 minutes, myself by myself, what we're going through. And we are breaking down everything from prepayment penalties to dealing with tenants and renting apartments. Thank you so much for your time today, Charles. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.